sing this two times. I Number eight. Sixty nine. <clears throat> we'll sing this song and then we'll have a short talk. Brother Ron sing all four verses of this song.
thank Joe for leading those songs. They are directed right to the point of what I hope to be able to say this morning and encourage us to take part of the emblems that we are about to take part of. I'm sure most everyone pretty much knows the story of how this got started. On a Thursday afternoon, the way that we count time, probably around 6 o'clock or maybe even 7 o'clock in the evening, Jesus and his disciples had met together in an upper room somewhere there in Jerusalem. And as they were eating the supper, the Passover supper, Jesus felt the need to spend a few minutes to establish what I believe is the greatest and most important memorial in the history of the earth. We know about memorials. We just had one last Monday. Most memorials take place annually. Once a year, we observe those things. This memorial, though, is done weekly. And he did that about six, maybe seven hours before he was arrested. He was arrested in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he had gone to pray, a prayer that was to help him get through the ordeal that he was about to undergo. While there in the garden, the soldiers came, and they took him first to Annas and then to Caiaphas. And over the course of the next several hours, he was ridiculed, he was beaten. Eventually, he was crucified, hung on the cross. He knew all of those things were about to happen that Thursday evening when he said what he did and created this memorial. He already knew he was going to be offered up as the sacrificial lamb, the innocent sacrificial lamb for the sins of mankind, yours and mine, and all other people's sins. But yet he knew that he had to do that. He had to establish this memorial. It's often asked, why do we observe this on the first day of every week? The answer is simple. It was on the first day of the week that Jesus arose from the tomb after having been crucified, put to death, and then buried in a tomb on the first day of the week, three days after he set the memorial up. And every first week, every day, every week has a first day of the week. And so we do that because of that. And Jesus promised all who follow him eternal life. When our earthly life is over here, we won't have to have the troubles that we have now. Things are going to be different in heaven, much different. I suspect, as I said, most of you have heard all of that. You knew about it. And you're probably asking why I'm here saying it for the umpteenth time when you already know it. Well, I have a reason. It's just one. But it's to help us put our minds in the right place 
so that we can partake of these emblems that we are about to partake of in a way that's pleasing to Jesus and to his Father in heaven. Because what we're thinking when we partake of these emblems is of the utmost importance to us. And it determines whether or not we're partaking worthily. We all know the physical part. We know when Jesus broke the bread that Thursday night, he said to them, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after that, when he had taken the cup, he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Those quotes, by the way, were taken from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 11, first letter to Corinth in chapter 11. Before each of those emblems, he said, do this in remembrance of me. So I want to ask you a question. What exactly are we to be remembering when we partake of these emblems. Did Jesus merely want us to think of his body, his physical body, when we partake of the bread? I don't think so. I think there was more to it than that. I don't know a single person in this world who has seen Jesus' body. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it. So how can we remember it? We don't know what it looked like. We don't know how severe the pain was and the, the damage that was done to his body. All we can do is read how he suffered. And we get the idea that it was a tremendous amount of suffering that he underwent. That's what we're supposed to be remembering, the suffering when we take part. So let me ask you again. When you take that piece of bread out of the tray and you place it between your lips, what's in your mind at that very moment? Is your mind focused on that pain and anguish that he suffered? Or is it someplace else? If, if our minds are not focused at that point on what we're doing and what that represents, then we're not partaking worthily. And it won't be acceptable to us. And as we sip from the cup, what exactly are we supposed to be remembering then? If the bread represents all of the pain and the suffering that we've just described concerning the body of Christ, then what does the cup represent? All too often, I'm afraid as we partake of these emblems that the men who offer the prayers for them, the men who prepare us to partake of those emblems, pretty much say about the same thing when they offer the prayer for the bread as they do when they offer the prayer for the cup. So are we supposed to be remembering the same thing twice? No, we aren't. And it is a problem if we are, if we do that. The pain and agony that Jesus suffered that pain was done to his body. And as a result, we are definitely to be thinking of that pain and anguish whenever we take of the bread. But if we look carefully at what Paul wrote in that letter to the church at Corinth in regard to the blood, I believe you will see 
that we're not supposed to remember again the pain and agony. Paul records what Jesus said. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now think about that. There's no pain there. In fact, there's joy there. The new covenant is the thing that gives us the hope to be free from sin, to have our sins washed away, and to be able to live eternally in heaven when this life is over. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, he said. That means the shedding of Christ's blood, meaning his death, ratifies or confirms the new covenant. Think back to the old covenant under the law of Moses. What did you have to do when you wanted to worship the Lord? Everyone was guilty of sin. So before we could do that, we had to offer a sacrifice if we lived at that time. We had to take an innocent animal and put it to death. And I wonder just how much anguish they must have felt when they did that, knowing that that animal had done nothing wrong but yet it had to give its life up in order for them to be deemed able to speak with God and worship him and approach him. Jesus was that sacrifice for us. But the blood that he shed was the ratification of the new covenant as the Hebrew writer said, a will cannot be satisfied without proof that the testator has died. That blood that was shed on the cross was that proof. And so when we partake of the fruit of the vine, we must be thinking of the benefits of being free from sin under the new covenant because those sins have been forgiven. And we need to partake of it thinking that we need to live our lives for the rest of our lives in such a fashion so that we'll be able to enjoy life in the hereafter rather than punishment eternally. When we think when our minds are focused as we partake of the bread and as we sip the cup, let's do it in a worthy manner. Let's have our minds in the right place as we partake of them. And let's do that now. Let's pray. Our most loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to remember your son and his sacrifice that he made for us. And Father, we pray that you would bless this bread that represents his body and his pain and his suffering. And Father, we pray that we would look back at that, at that day and that we would remember everything that he went through for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son who came to this world and lived a life that was perfect so that we might have the hope of eternal life and the forgiveness of our sins. As we partake of this emblem, we thank you for that sacrifice that he made for us. May we partake pleasingly in his name. Amen. And as we sing number 314, Please, you know this bass is a whole lot easier for me to sing, and that's all. 
<clears throat> anyway, please mark 276 as a song of encouragement. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for every blessing that you have given us, both those things that are spiritual and those things that are physical. Be with us now as we partake in this offering of giving back some of the physical things that you have given to us, and may we do so with a, a happy heart as we have determined in our minds. In Christ's name we pray. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here today on this Lord's Day. Ron told me a couple weeks ago that I needed to preach a 20-minute sermon today because his talk was going to be detailed and at length, and I didn't believe him when he told me that. I will say this, that I appreciate so very much what Ron had to say this morning. We could end the service right now and not have to listen to me, or you wouldn't have to listen to me, but I'm not going to be that kind to you. <laughs> it is, I, I, I've just, just got to say this, when, when he started talking about the blood, and I don't know if he saw me or not, but when he started talking about salvation and hope, I kind of gave it one of these little, I almost shouted amen out loud to go along with that. It was, it was wonderful, and it's wonderful to be here today. I am so grateful that we can have the opportunity on each Lord's Day to be able to assemble together, to be able to do the things that we've done, to be able to remember, to revere, and to glorify our God and his Son. And so I hope and pray that you've benefited from being here so far this morning and that you'll continue to benefit as we look at our theme for the year, A Portrait of Discipleship. And this morning we're going to be looking at it from this point, the picture that we have of discipleship as a child of God. It's one of those instances that I look back and I, I remember being young. I, I can remember maybe not as young as, as this toddler in the picture here, I, but I remember as a child. I remember wanting to crawl up on my mother and my father's laps. And I wanted, felt secure there because I was their child and I knew that I was loved. I remember and I, I see the same thing in, in little children today who can't wait for their daddy to come home from work and run and jump in his arms. Who want to, when he's laying down on the couch, come up and climb up on top of him and, and snuggle with him while he's there. I know that there's a closeness in the physical realm that we have established that that type of contact with our parents, with our fathers, is necessary. And as children of God, there's also a necessity to feel close to him to feel secure 
And I think as we look at this tough topic this morning and, and talk about it as being children of God, then we're going to, to look at it and, and hopefully come up with a, a much greater appreciation of what it means as a disciple of Jesus Christ to be able to be called a child of God. In Luke chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and I've got verse 2 here on the screen, and that's what I'm going to look at right now. Luke records for us, So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. The disciples had asked Jesus, basically, to teach them to pray. And this is how he started out. If you pay attention, he instructs his disciples to address God as their father when they pray. You see, there is a sense of a familial relationship between God in heaven and those who are created in his likeness. It is through Jesus Christ, through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, through the shedding of his blood and the hope of salvation that he's brought into this world, that we can be, have this possibility of even being called God's children. And in this lesson, as we look at some of the attributes and blessings of being God's children, let's keep that in mind. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. There is a privilege that is afforded to those who understand that Jesus Christ was the one that was sent into this world. To the Jews, as, as John is writing this gospel message and they're reading this, many of them would not have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They would have rejected him. But to those who come to this knowledge, come to this understanding, those who become obedient to his will, they have the right to be called children, children of God. John talks about that right. He reveals it to us in, in, in these verses. And even the Apostle Paul speaks of this type of family relationship that we have when you go over to Romans chapter 8 and you begin looking at verse 14 and, and you see right there within that text, Paul is talking about the family of God. And he speaks of it in such a way where in verse 14 it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now we're going to be looking at, at several aspects of this text throughout the lesson, so I'm not going to spend time right now looking at this. But one of the things that we have confidence in is the fact that if we have truly been obedient to our Savior's desires and will, that we can have confidence that the Spirit knows we belong to God. You've heard me say over and over again since I've been here, remember who you are and whose you are. The Spirit will testify to that fact if you are truly His child. And so that's important for us to, to take into consideration and, and understand. And the Apostle Paul also points out, he talks about adoption. Well, I know what the Scripture says, that God only had one begotten Son, and that was Jesus Christ, and He sent Him into this world to die for us. So how can we become children of God? Well, Paul says, through the spirit of adoption within this text. And really, we understand this fairly well, I think, because we know that in order for us to become children, there's only one of two ways that that can be possible. I was born to my mother and father, Anne and Gail Lockmiller, in the flesh. 
I wear the name Lockmiller because I was born into that name. But then there's a second way in order for us to become children of God, and that is through adoption. And, and Brother Randy Cavender's son has adopted a child here recently, within the last two years. It's been two years. It's Zeke's three years old now? Three years ago. When they adopted Zeke, what happened to Zeke? He was given their name, wasn't he? Zeke looks at his father, his dad, and calls him dad because he's been adopted. He's treated as the son, the same as Xander is a son, even though Xander was born to them in the flesh. They get to share in the same rights and privileges of of being a member of that family. And, and what we learn within this particular context of Romans chapter 8 is that even though we are adopted, we get to share with Jesus Christ the privileges of being God's child. And so I want us to think about that and consider that a little bit longer this morning and, and understand that this right here, when you talk about adoption, adoption brings a much deeper meaning to being born again. When you think about the scriptures teach us that we are saved. The scriptures speak of those who are born again in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, having been born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. The scriptures teach us that being saved is being adopted. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5 having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And really when we start talking about being born again, experiencing that renewal of life, beginning that transformation as children of God, adoption brings a much deeper meaning than simply being buried in baptism and coming out of the water and just being dunked in water. It has privileges to it. To accept care for one who is not born into your family takes a special kind of love. It requires a compassion that is demonstrated through what God did by sending his son into this world. A love that is demonstrated not only by God but by the son who wants to call us brethren. Being born again stresses a spiritual recreation. Adoption presents to us an image of rescue and redemption. So I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. I want you to take into consideration some things this morning. There's a discussion going on in Matthew chapter 18 that Jesus is going to, to have to correct. The disciples are are discussing who's are debating among themselves who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus takes and sets a little child, has them bring a little child and sets it in the midst of them. And in verse 3, he says this, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes that, that, you might look at that and that, that might be a little bit puzzling to to understand, but you think about children and, and who they are and, and just the glow on their faces when they come into a room and, and look at you, the smiles that they have on their faces, the innocence, the purity of mind. And eventually over time that gets lost because initially they, they, don't, they haven't been disappointed. They haven't learned to distrust people but when Jesus is talking to them and telling them that they need to become his little children there are some characteristics of little children that I think are important to us and the first of which is humility humility is a characteristic that is spoken of throughout scripture and it's expected of God's children children then are, are that great example of that very thing of that very trait generally speaking we don't see in children arrogance or boastfulness 
until they become much much older, when they get past the toddler years, and, and until they when they become a teenager, or maybe not a little bit younger than that even. But we see in them a, a humility that is absolutely necessary. The, the toddler, that child, has the attitude of submitting to those who are in charge of their care. And humility for the child of God requires that very thing because we are placing ourselves in God's hands into his care when we receive Jesus Christ, when we are born again, when we are adopted as sons, we're seeking his care. We must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 said, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. But not only is humility part of that, by placing ourselves in the care of God, in God's hands, we're also expressing trust. And there's that, okay, children. How much do they trust? How, how much do children trust their fathers especially? How many times have you seen children, father hold them up in the air and then toss them in the air and that child just cackle because they trust the father is going to catch them as they come back down? That might make a lot of some individuals nervous, but that child trusts the father. What is our trust like when it comes to God? Are we, have we really wondered why children are so trusting? Could it be their humility toward those who care for them creates in them a trust that they know they are loved and that they will be provided for? And maybe it is because that they haven't suffered that disappointment. Maybe because they haven't reached a point in, in life where that disappointment makes them cynical or suspicious. Our God, though, is faithful. Our willingness to trust him is an acknowledgement even of his faithfulness. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9, Moses speaks to the children of Israel and says, Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. What was he saying? You can trust God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 calls God the faithful God. Why? Because we as children can humbly come to him and trust him. Not only is trust part of it, innocence is another attribute that they, that they have. You know, you, you think about that. One of the greatest qualities of being a child is that purity of mind. It hasn't quite been polluted yet by the world, but over time that changes, doesn't it? That innocence is obvious when they look into the eye, when you look into the eyes of toddlers and we try to, what, what do we do? We as adults, as parents, try to protect them as long as we can from the ravages of the world. They remain free of suspicion and cynicism as long as we can protect them. They don't have ulterior motives in their actions. And I believe God desires that his children be innocent. But innocent from what? Innocent from sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. The Apostle Paul says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding how we are in malice. Be babes, but in understanding be mature. We need to grow up as children. Understanding what the world has to offer us. And understanding that we can trust God and remain innocent through the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood. Forgiveness is another aspect of this childlike nature that we need to have. And children are wonderful examples of, of being willing to forgive and, and reconciling much more quickly than we do when we're adults. Just look at children out on a playground at school and, and them fussing and feuding and, and maybe even getting in a little fisticuffs. And after a few minutes... After all that's taken place, what sometimes do you commonly see? The same two people over playing with each other. And all of a sudden, they've got their arms around each other and their best buds. 
Well, fussing, fighting, and arguing is part of life sometimes. But their willingness to set aside their differences, their willingness to reconcile is a characteristic that God expects of his children. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Be willing to forgive as children of God. And then growth. Growing up is something that is, is natural to us. I told my two grandchildren that stop growing. And they keep looking at me and say, no. Abigail has a, has a habit of, of telling us when her next birthday is and set, telling us how old she's going to be. No, you're not. Yes, I am. As a child, what do we look forward to? We look forward to that next birthday, didn't we? As an adult, we want to reverse the clock. But as children of God, there are things that as we are growing, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, it was even said of Jesus Christ when he was young in, in, in the flesh, that what did he do? He increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Increased in wisdom and stature. That was growing. We do that physically. But God also expects the same thing from us spiritually as his children. God expects his children to grow in respect to their knowledge and understanding of his will. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Growth is part of our lives as children. Become like little children is what Jesus told us. And in order for us to be called children, then we need to also understand that not only do we need to have these characteristics, but we need to appreciate the blessings of being a child of God. Blessings are, 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 are wonderful. And really, what Ron expressed this morning about the blood of Jesus Christ, that was a blessing. It's a blessing to the suffering. The suffering was a blessing. But the hope that's in the blood of Jesus Christ is a blessing to us. But as we said with the spirit of adoption, now, what we have and what we have been given is a new name. It's not just, we don't look like the rest of the world. We don't act like the rest of the world. We're given a new name, Christian. Adopted children take on the name of their family. And as a child of God, we're given that new name. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. The disciples were called Christians where? First, in Antioch. With that new name, we have a new identity. That new identity stands in contrast to the world's identity. Where we have identified before with the world. We're now part of a family that is not of this world. We're part of a family that does not seek the things of this world, but the things of above. We're part of a family who is to be shining lights in a world of darkness. We're to be lights on the hill that are not to be hidden, according to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. The Apostle Paul describes it a little bit differently in Philippians chapter 2 when he talks about the fact that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now you're not trying to draw attention to yourself, but it's going to be obvious that if you're a child of God, you're going to stand out. You're going to be different. You're going to be that type of individual that will be able to lead others to Christ. Christ, because you have put on a new name. One of the blessings of being a child of God is the love and attention that God bestows upon us because you think about this. There are people in the world today that have accused God of being aloof, of being hard to approach, not caring. We sing songs in our songbook, Does Jesus Care? Oh, yes, He cares. And we know that our Father cares. The fact that we are his children should be evidence enough that he is a loving and caring God. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. Beloved, 
What matter of love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God? Well, what's the manner of love? He gave his only begotten Son. The one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one can come to the Father except through him. That manner of love allows us to be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know him because it did not know him. It know us because it did not know him. As children, he pays attention. He's not aloof. He's not hard to find. But he knows us. He knows our struggles. He knows our pain. He knows what we're going through. He knows when we're full of joy. He hears our prayers. That's part of his love and attention. The 34th Psalm in verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. In verse 17 of that same chapter, he goes on to say, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. We know, and we'll talk about prayer this evening. We know that the prayers of the righteous avail much, which means God listens to his children. He provides for us. You know, one of the things that is taught throughout Scripture is the importance of fathers providing for their families, for their children. We see that in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But God provides for his own. Psalm 37 and verse 25. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have seen the righteous for... I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging. And how do I know this to be true? Well, we even sing songs about this too. We sing songs, Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love, abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will care for you. God will take care of you. He provides. Matthew chapter 7, he talks about anxiety and what we need not worry about, the things that will be provided for us. He provides. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. But if he's willing to take care of sparrows, how much more is he willing to take care of us, his children? And then we have his protection. Brother Rick this morning, in his prayer, if you listen to it, talked about the Father protecting us. And we maintain and have the Father's protection. God is faithful to protect us from the evil one, which was prayed for. Protect us from that evil one. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. You see, God, He, li he limits the severity of our temptations to what we are able to cope with and always provides us a way of escape in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Our God has promised never to leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And therefore, we can be confident as children that we can overcome the world because our Father is greater than anything in this world. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is found in 1 John chapter 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We have that comfort. We have that confidence. We have the Father's protection. We have the Father's guidance. Our earthly fathers are commanded to teach and admonish their children. What are we told to do in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4? To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But God has provided instruction. Peter says he's provided us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 
He's provided that guidance and instruction so that we can look at him as the psalmist did in Psalm chapter 23 and say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He is our guide, according to Matthew chapter 6. He is a child of God. We are led by his spirit, Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. And as our loving father, he will also discipline us when necessary. That type of guidance. Because what does God do? He disciplines those whom he loves. It brings him no pleasure when it's necessary. But when we are redirected through that admonishment, that rebuke, it redirects us back to him. And so we also have responsibilities as children of God. But we receive an inheritance. There's that thing that is mentioned there in Romans chapter 8. Being joint heirs with Jesus Christ. When we are adopted as children of God, we not only obtain that new name, but we also share in all the rights and the privileges of being a child of God. We share an inheritance as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Verses 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 8. We become partakers in this inheritance. And that inheritance is reserved for us in heaven. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. You can also see that the inheritance in heaven mentioned in 1 Peter chapter three, chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. But what are our responsibilities? We'll close the lesson with this. Our responsibilities are to faithfully wear the name that we've been given. All too often we look at individu individuals look at it and say, well, I've been baptized. Well, baptism <coughs> is just its beginning point. Because when you come up out of that watery grave, you're supposed to walk in a newness of life. And that is a continuous walk. It is a walk of faithfulness. It is a walk that when John was writing the book of Revelation... And he was writing to the seven churches of Asia. He wrote to one of them, be faithful till death and you'll receive that crown of life. We wear that name, Christian, not as a badge of arrogance, but one of humility and service to God. The Apostle Paul in his humility identified himself as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, I know that had to do with his chains, but the word servant was what was important there. As children of God, we wear that name by keeping ourselves separate from the world. And we lay the solid foundation that God has given to us, that having this seal from God, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In this, we reciprocate God's love. We return love to him because he first loved us. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus said, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his, or John said this in 1 John chapter 5. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. We remain obedient to him and show our love to him by keeping his commands. We walk by faith and not by sight. Walking by faith is trusting in God to provide. Walking in faith is trusting God to protect. Walking in faith is trusting in God to guide us. We trust that he provides for our physical and spiritual needs and trust that he will also keep his promise of salvation and eternal life. And we abide in his word. We must feast upon the pure milk of the word as Peter describes in 1 Peter chapter 2. Then we must desire that strong meat, that solid food that the Hebrew writer discusses in Hebrews chapter 5. And in order for that to happen, 
then we need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Dwell in us, according to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. And understand this. We never need to leave the house when we're there. The safety and security of being in the household of God is wonderful. There have been those who at times, like the prodigal did in Luke chapter 15, decided that they didn't want to hang around anymore. But you know there's a beauty of that story in, in Luke chapter 15 that you don't have to stay gone. You can always come home. Those that have departed from the house of God, he'll give you that second chance for reconciliation and to be called his child again. But we must, when we sin, we must repent, confess that sin to him, seek his forgiveness. And according to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, he'll be faithful and just to forgive us of our unrighteousness. That's a lot to unpack when you talk about being a child of God. There are so many things that are, are blessings and, and of being a child of God. But one of the things we need to realize, God is our creator and deserving of our faithfulness to him. And what he wants from us is to be our father. He loves us that much. He desires our return of love to him. And so let us remain faithful to him. For what reason? There's an eternity waiting us. Eternity with the Father. Eternity with the Son. Eternity with the faithful who are all children of God. Is that your desire this morning? To become a child of God? To be one who can cry out, truly cry out, Abba, Father, to your Creator? If you've never obeyed the gospel, you're not yet a child of God then. That opportunity can be yours this morning. If you have that desire and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to repent of your sins and confess Him before men, then the next step is to be buried in baptism, to wash away your sins, to be able to rise and walk in newness of life and be given that new name, become an adopted child of God. Become a joint heir with Christ. We stand ready to assist you with that. Be reconciled to God today. And if we can help you in your soul's salvation, won't you come? And together we stand and as we sing.
162 will be our dismissing song. He almost quoted a bunch of that a while ago, but <clears throat> he probably didn't know it. We want to take this time to invite our visitors to come back and be with us in any opportunity you have. We thank you for being here today, not only you, but everybody. It's been a good morning. We're thankful that you're here. Let's remember the ones that needs our prayers each day, even those that's in the back of the bulletin, especially those that are confined. Pray for them. Pray for all of them that needs our help. Sing one and four, and then we'll ask Brother Mick to come to the microphone and dismiss us. Be Thank you for watching the live stream of our worship this morning. The members of Park Hill would like to invite you to join us in person if you are ever in our area for a Bible study at 9.30 a.m. Sunday mornings, for our worship assembly at 10.15, and our Sunday evening worship at 5 p.m. We also have Bible study classes for all ages Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Come back and join us at 5 p.m. this evening when we will live stream our worship on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you and have a wonderful day.